Welcome to the Spirit of a Badass, where we celebrate stories of courage, hope, and resiliency. I'm your host, Alicia Jacobson. Hello to all my badasses joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to thank you for being here and for your support. I'm so grateful for all the messages and DMs I get from you sharing how the show has impacted you. If you would like to help support the podcast, a few ways are leaving a review, sending to friends, and sharing on social media with a link to the show. The more you share, the greater impact the spirit of a badass can have. So thank you for those who keep sharing. And if you'd like to show your support, please do. All right, let's get into today's episode. I first became aware of my guest through her GoFundMe. Reading her story, knowing we were the same age and had so much in common really hit home. Today, you're going to hear Larissa's story of how she found out she had breast cancer and what she is doing now to help other women. We're recording this in October, which, as you may know, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Today, we will be spreading awareness, and I hope that hearing Larissa's story stirs up something in you that perhaps wasn't there before. Larissa is a business owner, mom of three, and advocate for breast cancer awareness. Welcome, Larissa. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. You just got back from vacation, right? We sure did. We got yeah, back where from, were you? we were in Hawaii. It's the first Ooh. time I've ever been. That's something we've been thinking about for years. My husband has a conference there every October that he could go to, and we've never done it. And this year we were like, nope, we got to do it. We got to do it now. The time's now. So we did yeah. it. And it was as magical as everybody says it is. <laughs> oh, I bet. And yeah. now you, I, I saw a post that you did on social media. And yeah. you've had sort of a shift with your thinking that caused you to say, this is the year I'm going. Tell us about that sort of shift that you had. Absolutely. There's a ton of you know pretense to how I got here. I haven't always thought that way. Over the last two years, as I've been going through a breast cancer journey, we have really come to realize how quick time moves and how you you never really know what's going to happen. And so that has been a huge reason that we kind of, we, we think about time in a totally different way. The time is now, you never know what tomorrow is going to be. And so this year we, we saw the conference coming up and it culminates in the Ironman championships in Kona, which is another really cool piece of it. But we were like, we got to do this. And so we did it with our kids and it was I mean, it is an amazing place and it was an amazing trip that I'm really thankful we took. Yeah. The time is now. Yeah. That's exactly that's a, right. That's a great motto. The time I is think now. about getting that tattooed on my own arm all yeah. the time. The time is now because it, yes. I mean, it really is part of how we live and think now. Okay. Wonderful. So we kind of flash (laughs) forward and that's a little like peek into how your mindset has shifted. And we'll hear more about that later, but take us to the beginning of your story. Yeah. So I was 39. I had started my own business doing interior design, mostly residential in 2019. Through that, I have social media that I kind of need to keep up and started talking to a person about books on social media. Her name is Taryn Pemberton. Um, She was a fashion blogger in Madison at that time, started chatting online. And finally, one night we were like in the summer, we're like, let's meet in person. So we went to Bar Taco in the summer on a like Friday night and the wait was two hours long as it is. (laughs) And so we sat outside and just talked for two hours. And in that conversation, she shared her story about being 38 and being on her second revision for breast cancer. And at that time, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so cool that she's sharing this story with me. And I, it like, it, it gives me chills now thinking about it, but it didn't register at that time that I was like, oh, this is something I should really be worried about because I was super healthy was going into my 40th birthday feeling like, yes, I'm going to be one of those 40 year olds who, you know, looks and feels really young and healthy. And like my forties are going to be my best years. And about a year later, when I was turning 40, 
I was like, oh, I'm turning 40. I'm just going to do a self breast exam for the first time, because that's something that Taryn had mentioned to me. I didn't have family history. I didn't have lifestyle risk factors. And so I did the self exam in the shower, which is the best place to do it. Now I say do it on the first of the month, every month. If you, if you're a human being, do it. So I felt something. My mom has dense breast tissue, which many, many women do. So I just assumed it was something like that and went on with my day. We had a 40th birthday trip planned to Mexico. Went on that trip. I was like, I'll deal with this when I get back. I had a colleague of my husband's who I called and said, hey, felt this lump, probably need to set up a mammogram, but I've never had one. So I was like, I don't think it's a big deal. So there's no rush. And she was like, no, there's a rush. Let's get you in ASAP. So still just in my head, I was like, this is going to be nothing. I went to that appointment by myself, just assuming it would be standard in and out. Had heard that mammograms hurt, but other than that, I was like, no big deal. Got in the position (laughs) against the machine and you know, it, it didn't really hurt. I was like, this is not a big deal. And then the tech who had was doing the mammogram was like, okay, I'm going to take it to the radiologist. You just stay in here. I'll be back in a minute. She came back a couple minutes later and just said, so we're just going to do a couple different angles. And I'm like, okay, cool. But really at that point, I was like, that's not normal, right? Like, Usually that's just, they take these couple standard angles and then you're done. Um, She took a couple more angles. Um, She walked me out to a waiting room where I'm sitting in my, like my gown in this waiting room, just my mind just started like spinning. She came back and said, okay, we're going to do an ultrasound as well. Um, We see something that doesn't look totally normal. And she couldn't tell me anything about what it was, but I'm ushered into this dark radiology room where they do the ultrasounds. And I was, at that point, I was terrified. I mean, I, even just talking about it now, I can feel the tightness in my chest thinking about that moment. So they did the ultrasound and the radiologist left again and he came back and he said, is there someone you would like to call? And at that moment I was just like, oh my gosh, is this really happening? And thankfully, I was able to get my husband on speakerphone. And the radiologist said, you have a mass. They have a rating scale for lumps in your breast. And it's basically zero to six. Um, He said, yours is a five, which means there's a 95% chance of malignancy. So at that point, I was like, I have breast cancer. And my brain just turned off. I'm thankful that my husband was on the phone, because I have no idea what happened in the rest of that appointment with the radiologist. I have no idea what he said. I was just stunned. So out of anything that I had ever expected to happen. So that was the moment I got the news. It was devastating. You know, they immediately started scheduling a whole bunch of other tests. They did a couple biopsies just to confirm what it was, to confirm the size, the shape, the type, and found out that it was stage three estrogen positive breast cancer, which means that estrogen causes the cancer cells to grow. So as a woman, that is, that's bad news. (laughs) Um, So quickly after that, We were actually on a trip in Door County and they said, we think this is what it is. We need to confirm it. So, you know, we took this trip with my kids end of the summer trip and I had that in my head the whole time. And I'm just trying to be normal, (laughs) you know, and like be happy and fun. The kids think we're on vacation and I'm, you know, just sitting in my head about what's our life is changing we got the confirmation via my chart while we were in Door County and my husband was able to kind of read it and explain it. And it was just, I remember we put the kids to bed, but we were in rooms next to each other. And I just remember crying quietly in my room, trying not to wake them up, but just being so shocked that this, that that was happening. So sad, so scared at that point. Yeah. I think At the beginning, when you don't know anything, it feels 
absolutely terrifying because it keeps going back to, I have three kids. Am I going to die? One in seven women get breast cancer. And I've lost so many friends now that I'm in this community that are, were my age, that had kids my kid's age. And it was just, it was a really scary moment. Um, yeah. So, you know, after that, after it was confirmed, they put you on this pipeline right away. So I had the, the choice of picking oncologists and surgical oncologists and got some recommendations from people who'd gone through it about what they liked and didn't like about their care providers and ended up starting chemo in September. I shaved my head <laughs> knowing that my hair was going to fall out. That was really, a t I mean, that feels like kind of a, this little thing in the scope of like, you could die. You're also losing your hair. But like, really, that was, that became something that was really tough. As I went through chemo, basically, I would do chemo on Wednesdays. Every other week, I would have a couple really good days, and then I would just bottom out. And those days, I literally couldn't get out of bed. And I think... Prior to cancer, I saw myself as valuable because of what I could do for everybody. I was really strong. I could do everything. I had a ton of energy. I could be everything to everybody. And I, I valued myself for that, I realized really quickly. But I also felt like, well, that's why everybody loves me, you know? Shit. Right. How did you... How did you because that's, that's really significant yeah. because if you're unable to to do those things how did yeah. you manage that because that's a big deal I mean it was I think that was another massive mindset shift that I had to make I you know I struggled I was so depressed for like the first you know I don't even know it, it was a long time, let's just say yeah. that, because suddenly I went from being healthy and feeling great and being able to do everything and my business was doing great and, you know, my kids were happy to, like, laying in bed and my husband had to do everything. There were those kind of bottom-out days. I had four or five days where I was just, like, flat out. I felt exhausted. I felt nauseous. I felt, you know... As, as chemo went on, the symptoms got worse and worse. So, you know, I lost my hair. I lost weight. I lost a bunch of my fingernails. I had sores in my mouth. My eyes were constantly burning and I just couldn't be who I was. And I was like, who am I? And I went through this very existential crisis of like, if I don't look like I used to look, if I can't function like I used to function, who am I? am I? And like, what is my purpose here anymore? And I think, you know, the obvious answer had to be for me, at least it was like, my kids need me still. But I was like, this is like hell. I have a Christian faith. And I talked to a ton of people who, some who'd gone through it, some who just knew me pretty well. And were like, Marissa, you, your value is not in how functional you are. It's not in how you look. It's not in the fact that you own a business even. It's not in any of those things. It is in who you are and how you love the people around you. And I think that was, it wasn't an easy shift for me to make. And I struggled with it forever. And I still struggle with it, to be perfectly honest, now that I'm, now that I'm feeling more functional. Because well, you're doing the things again now. Yeah, you're doing the things. Yeah, yeah. Now that I can do the things. I will say another really good thing that came out of that was me being able to say no. Hell yeah. <laughs> way, yeah, exactly, right? Me being way more in touch with my own needs. I think of it sometimes as like toxic efficiency, where I was so efficient that I A, didn't have a second to think about my own needs. And so I was super disconnected physically and emotionally from my own body. But also that's all I thought I was worth was what I could be for everybody else. So that's not me anymore. And I'm super grateful for that. That's something that I probably 
God, I wish I wish I didn't have to go through cancer to learn that. <laughs> yeah. How did how do you how would somebody know that? If they saw you five years ago and then see you today, like how are you showing up differently that is not you anymore? Yeah, I mean, I think my family is probably the most aware of it, but a lot of people are aware of it. I ask for help when I need it. I'm, I'm starting to work out again regularly because it's a great cancer risk reducer and I just love working out and I have the energy to do it again. But if I, like I have a cold right now, if I, this morning I set out my stuff to go to spin class at 5.30 and I woke up at like 4.45 and I was like, I feel like crap. And so I stayed in bed. And in previous times, I just would have like been like, I'm doing it. I'm going because I'm. I, that's what I do. I just do the things. So there's that kind of thing personally. I think, you know, like I said, asking for help is something that I was like, I don't need help. I don't need anybody. And it's kind of a badge of honor, like to not ask for help. I mean, you're like, I got this. Yeah. I have my cape. Heck yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I've got everything. Yeah. It was a hard shift to make, but the, all those things were kind of tied together. And I, man, it's, it is humbling when you literally don't got it. You don't got it. And you have to say, I can't get out of bed and I have to go to the bathroom right now. And I have to say, okay, Mark, please help me. There were so many points like that. You know, people came with me to chemo. It was granted, it was like over COVID. So it was very limited. We were wearing masks. I could have one person come with me, but I was terrible at and got really good at asking for and accepting help and just recognizing what a beautiful part of that transaction I could be, even if I wasn't the one offering the help. It's such a gift. And oh my gosh, you know, someone immediately set up a meal train for me. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm sure we'll like, we can figure it out. We can do freezer stuff. And every, everybody was like, stop it, Larissa. People want, they love you and they want to help you. Let them like make you a meal. And I was like, ugh, it feels bad. But isn't that wild? Oh yeah. Because if you were the one like, yeah, I'll help you. It feels so good to help somebody. But when it comes to women, I mean, this, I work with women on this all the time, like one saying, yes, please help me, or I need help. And then also like the transaction of accepting the help and accepting yes. it without feeling like you have to reciprocate or like feeling guilty oh, for it. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like such a game changer when you can get to the other side of that. And you were forced there, but in life to get to the other side of that and to be able to receive the support and the 100%. help, like it changes who you are also. Yeah. Like it's this beautiful thing inside you to, to receive that. And then it gets easier as you continue to do it. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, even at the beginning, I was like, okay, I can accept the meals, but I feel like I probably need to write thank oh. you notes to everybody. <laughs> And everyone was like, stop it, stop, 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 stop. And so I stopped. I have been able to, I think, take it back to a place where instead of helping people until I am resentful and exhausted and crabby, I help people out of the joy of being able to be with the people that I care about. So I think that has been a really healthy thing for me internally and I hope it's something that my kids see. And because I saw my parents who worked and worked and worked and worked and didn't know how to rest and were so resentful. And I wanted to be different than that. Yeah. And now I am. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. So, yeah, I mean, I think that was a huge, a huge thing for me. Chemo ended December 29th of 2021. That was a big, big day. I was physically just completely destroyed by the end of it, but it felt like that was my point where I was starting to be able to rise again, if that makes sense, (laughs) you know, and I had no hair and my joints felt like crap. And I, I mean, I looked like a 70 year old and felt like a 70 or 80 year old. What was your rising like? you said, I felt like I was able to rise again. Like, what was that experience like? 
so after chemo, I tried to keep working out through chemo because I knew that exercise is one of the only things that is 100% proven to help reduce your cancer risk. So it's so healthy for you in every way possible. I didn't know that. Please note that everybody listening. (laughs) I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And there are all these little snippets where it was like, I went back to my first, I do, I do this hip hop class called work with a Q, W E R Q. I went back to my first class and I was bald and I was sucking wind through this class, but I like went back to that class and I was like, Oh my God, I made it through this class. This is amazing. And then I started noticing my hair starting to grow back. And it like, I can't even tell you, it looked like a baby bird. It was white and kind of like fuzzy when it first came out. And it looked really terrible, but I was like, like, this is amazing. So it was just all of these little things. The first week that I didn't have to lay down every day of the week. Because chemo, you know, it hits you really hard while you're going through it, but then it continues to affect your energy and your body for months and months afterwards. People say it can take up to a year or more to recover from doing chemo. And I found that to be pretty true. So it's just, you know, these last couple months this summer, I have an 11, 13 and 14 year old. And I was like the driver this summer while also working and, you know, taking care of our house and our two pets and like life. And I was able to keep up with them. And that felt huge. It's been a really slow process. And after chemo ended, I still had surgeries and I had radiation. I had a double mastectomy in February, had radiation May, June, and then had a revision surgery after that. So I still have, I've had two smaller revision surgeries this year. I have another one in December. So that has kind of been ongoing, but just even mentally feeling stronger again. Cancer, for me at least, it put this fear in the back of my mind that just lived there. And it's like I could get busy with other things and not think about it. But then at night when I was laying awake having hot flashes <laughs> because I was in menopause, medical menopause, that that would start to kind of take over. In COVID, I joined TikTok because that's what everybody did. <laughs> Just doing like fun dances and whatever. When I started my cancer journey, I started posting about that on TikTok because I, I'm like a younger cancer survivor and I didn't really know anyone <clears throat> with the exception of one friend in town that I met at, in chemo, actually, that was younger and going through it. And now that I'm part of this bigger cancer community, my closest friend in Madison, Sarah, ended up passing away. And it is just, it's wild how I would be like, okay, I think mentally I'm like over some of the fear. And then I would get triggered by lots of different things where I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be my story too, you know? And someone gave me that really good advice just because someone has this one story that doesn't mean that it's going to be your story. And I had to keep telling myself that over and over and over to kind of overcome that fear of like, there's no way I'm going to get through this. Could you repeat that one more time? Because I think that's really important for anybody who may be in your situation, a similar situation. But I think what you just said could shift people in a really good way, especially in the nighttime when they're trying to sleep. Oh my gosh, yes. Yes. So just because that's their story doesn't mean it's your story. You know, people going through breast cancer have a million different stories and seeing the worst that could happen pushed me to those really dark places a lot. I love being in a community of cancer folks, cancer journeyers with me. I love being part of that community, but it also was super helpful for me to remember my story is my story. Their story is not necessarily going to be my story. And so that's something that I still have to remind myself every so often, but I will say I'm 
a little over two years out from my diagnosis and it is getting easier. And I'm so grateful for that because there were definitely times where I was like, I'm never going to be able to not feel afraid again. I'm going to go through the rest of my life looking over my shoulder, basically. And that is changing with time. And I'm so thankful for yeah, that. Those are those hijacking like um, thoughts and feelings and things that just yeah. like, creep in and they take up residency there. And oh, that's wonderful to hear. Nothing makes me feel more fulfilled than the work I do with my coaching clients. Have you ever felt like there's been a rut in your life that you couldn't get yourself out of? Whether you've wanted to focus more on work-life balance, start living a healthy lifestyle, or feel less stressed, coaching could be what you need to get out of your own way. Head to the show notes or go to aliciajacobson.com to book a discovery call with me and see if coaching is right for you. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Month is always kind of like a, I don't know, it, it's, it's a love-hate. I'm so thankful that we're spreading awareness about breast cancer because I was super unaware. And if someone hadn't shared with me, I wouldn't have caught it. But also everywhere you look, I'm reminded of the directions that it could go. And that I think every year is a little tough for me going through it. But that's good to know if anybody has, I know our, our nanny probably about the same time as you then got diagnosed because it was right I think maybe right before COVID. And so we, she was with us most of the time and we took the journey with her. And so that was really interesting, but I never thought about how this month could have that sort of dual (laughs) impact of, yes, we're so grateful for the awareness. And also it stirs up a lot of stuff inside. Could I just not think about it? Because yeah, it's in (laughs) your face. I mean, I go to the gym, like there's pink balloons, like everywhere it's right there. So yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I, yeah. So I always appreciate people who are like aware yeah. of that kind of duality and are kind of sensitive to it. So, yeah. Um, and that's great that you could hold both of those also without kind of judgment. Totally. And in this month, I have to allow myself to have those moments of like grief or like fear and Sarah, the friend who I lost said, okay, give yourself five minutes to sit down there and like be afraid or be sad, but then let's keep walking, walk away from it. And that is such good advice. Acknowledging those feelings, they're there and they're going to hurt you if you just shove them down. But acknowledging that you're having those feelings, letting yourself feel it and then saying, but this doesn't have to define me. I can keep going. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. So you are, you, you are spreading a message though. Now tell us about how this has shifted and what you are doing. Yeah. So when I started going on TikTok, it was not for any purpose, obviously, but when I started sharing my story, one of the first things that I did was start talking about wigs because that was something that I was like, I have this business. I was so anxious about going into meetings and stuff, feeling and looking how I looked. And I I felt like if I could even just look a little bit more like myself, I would have way more confidence in meetings with clients, with contractors. But wigs are really expensive. And that is not something that I knew about. I didn't know a thing about wigs. It was also really intimidating figuring out what I needed and how to put them on and how to keep them on. We have three kids. The kids were younger then and we had an active life and I was like, I'm going to lose a wig in public for sure. So it was sharing everything that I was learning with others. So they theoretically would have to go through less of that searching for themselves. And it just became this really beautiful thing. I'm at about 21,000 followers now. Um, And the number of times that I have people reach, I'll share something about like my ongoing process and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one. What has your experience been like? And I'm like, ah, yes, this is awesome. I only found out about it because someone shared her story with me. And what a gift to be able to share 
my story with other people. I would have loved someone to tell me, no, you cut all that lace off and you you don't need to use the combs. There are all these little things that I never thought I would need to know. <laughs> and then I did need to know them. And now I get to share my experience with others. And also I hope share joy and hope with others. Because I feel like this year I've gotten back to a place where I, I do feel really hopeful again. And I didn't for a really long time. So it was always encouraging to me when there were, you know, other folks on TikTok who were like, I am I'm two years ahead of you. It gets better. You're not going to feel like this forever. And so I just, I feel super lucky that I get to do that now for and with other people. And I'm still learning stuff on TikTok. There are still people that I'm like, you know, I having this revision surgery now. And I'm like, Hey, I know you had a revision. What did that look like for you? What could I expect? And it's been super cool. So love it. Isn't that wild that, I mean, you created this whole community on TikTok and that's where you're getting so much inspiration, hope and information. That's wild. I know it's a beautiful thing. And TikTok is a million different things. And the fact that cancer talk is a thing. I'm super grateful for it. I mean, that was, I I had a huge number of people who loved us and cared for us in our community while we were going through it. And I was so grateful for that. But also there's a difference between people who haven't gone through cancer and people who have no negative connotations there, but it's just, it was, I was so happy to be able to talk to people who intrinsically understood those feelings of rage or grief or hopelessness or hope when something went well. It was really gratifying and affirming to connect that way. Yeah. Oh, that's so fantastic. That's if I have one regret from like that, (laughs) that time period, it is not learning TikTok. Like I scrolled (laughs) through it, but I'm like, why? Like I tried a couple of times and I was like, no, that was my regret is not learning how to properly use TikTok. My kids will help me sometimes, but I'm I'm (laughs) playing around with it, but yeah, it's not, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was really amazing. I've I've taken breaks over the last couple of years as I've gone through periods where I'm like, mentally, I need to protect myself because I'm already feeling this way. But as I move forward and hopefully further and further away from kind of the active part of this, how can I still be an encouragement to other people and connect with other people who are going through it or people who are not? And I, I think one of the things that I will now say forever is on the first of the month, do your self exam in the shower. Because that's not something that I was doing. I did my first one and I found cancer and I'm alive because of that. So yeah, that's my ongoing rally cry is do your self exams. They're really important. Um, In addition to doing your self exams on the first of the month or whenever they're choosing, but that's, that's a good one where it's like, okay, this is just when I do this. It's just easy to remember. What other lessons would you, or takeaways, would you like anybody listening here to have? If, If you are going through a cancer diagnosis, I will say the first part of it for me was the most terrifying when you don't know anything about it. And all you can think of is cancer means I'm going to die. So make sure you're asking questions. If you are uncomfortable with a provider, change providers Don't ever feel like you're asking too many questions or like you are, oh, I don't want to annoy, annoy them by ask. Just ask the questions. Make sure you understand what your body is going through. It is so, so important. I think one of the kind of unfortunate lessons that I learned is that you also really have to advocate for yourself. I numerous at numerous points through this process appointments that were supposed to be scheduled were dropped or like people forgot to you know whatever schedulers or surgeons forgot to do this or forgot to do that I expected it to be something where I could just sit back and be like okay they are setting up my appointments they're the experts they're going to tell me what to do and unfortunately there have just 
been a lot of cases where I'm like, I have to advocate for myself. I have to know, hey, it's been longer than it should have been since I had my last injection. Call what's going on. So you got to advocate for yourself. But I think the most important one is that there's hope. I, When I was going through it, I did not feel hopeful. I felt like this is going to be what kills me. And my family is being destroyed in the process. And it felt so horrible. And even in the midst of treatment, look for little good things. Look for every little good thing. If you get a close parking spot at Target, get yourself a treat. Celebrate every good thing. That became really important for me because everything else was really hard. And so it was like, I'm going to look for these little joyful things that I can, I, I feel like they're reminders to be hopeful. And I think the other thing, you know, there's hope after this. I feel better every day. My kids are doing well. That was another thing at the beginning. I was so scared for what this was going to do to them. And I, I think they will all be more empathetic, loving people because of what we went through as a family. And no, you don't ever want your kids to have to get empathetic this way. <laughs> but hard, hard times come. And I'm so grateful that we were able to work through it together. I think the other thing that I wanted to say is to anyone who's supporting someone with a cancer diagnosis, cancer was really lonely. I didn't really know anyone else personally who was going through it. I felt like I was annoying when that was all I could think about. And there's nothing better that you can do for someone going through a cancer experience than to be with them. I had people who on my down days would come and sit with me and I would be unable to get out of bed and they would just come and sit on my bed with me and like talk. And that makes me cry just thinking about what a huge impact that was. I felt so alone for so much of that and people making meals that felt huge to me. My two best friends, one lives in Wausau, one lives in Alabama. I got that diagnosis. They flew in immediately and I will never be able to top that. I felt so grateful to not be alone. So if that's sending a funny meme that's going to make your friend laugh, if that's making them a meal, if that is going with them to chemo or sitting with them in their bed when they can't get out of it, that means the world. It meant the world to me. And that's that's like the best thing you can do is people who are willing to sit down there with you at the bottom for those five minutes and just let you say, here's where I'm at. I don't I don't need a I don't need comfort. I don't need a recommendation or a suggestion about what to do. I just don't want to be alone while I'm feeling this. So. Yeah, I hear this from people where they're like, I don't need uh, the, the recommendation. And this is for people like you, like going through some really hard things, like where people mean well, oh, but what yeah. they really need is exactly what you're saying is just to be there yes. alongside Presence. them and be yeah. in it with them, which totally. is also an interesting thing because also people are like, well, I don't want to bother them. So just show up, just show up and just be and let the other person be seen and heard and know that they're like taken care of with like love. Yes, exactly. And I, I mean, you find out really quickly who your friends are in that scenario because it's, it's a hard thing to go through and it's a hard thing to go through with someone else, I think too. And so I, I do feel like I have a much better perspective now when friends or family are struggling just about how simple it can be to, to let people know that they're not alone. Thank you. All right. We're going to, we're going to wrap this up with sharing your number one life hack or tip that has helped you save time, energy, or resources. Okay. Well, it's sort of bigger than that. It's, it is really that like shift. And I think it helps you save all of those because you, you're taking advantage of them. And it is, the time is now. It's recognizing that time is fleeting. 
it sounds really cliche, but dang, time is fleeting. If you want to start a business, start that business, make a plan. Your needs matter. For me, when I started my business, obviously it's not something you can start in one day. It's a dream I'd had for years, but make a plan and take one little step today. The time is now to do it. That trip to Hawaii, the time was now. Who knows what next year will be like. The time is now. You get to make memories. You get to do things that you love. You get to be the person that you know you are. And there's not a better time than right now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you for sharing your story and being vulnerable and showing up and just like you were shifted by the friend who you were sitting and waiting to have dinner with and hearing her story, like your story will, will shift things for people. And just thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to talk to you. Okay. Bye. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Spirit of a Badass is a Lit Path Studios podcast and is produced by Jamie Gale and Alicia Jacobson. Music by Shane Ivers. We'll be back with another inspiring interview. Until then, keep your spirits high and your energy badass.